My name is Bonifas Nyoike Nganga. I'm a capacity building uh, expert or a consultant, if you like that word. My greatest passion is to inspire people to be three things, authentic, excellent, and great. Because I feel like those are some of the things which if they are built and inculcated in people, then uh, a lot of the external issues will be resolved. So you realize that authenticity is an inner job, greatness is an inner job, excellence is an inner job. So my greatest passion is to see people embody those three qualities. I grew up in an interesting place uh, called Kawangware in Dangoreti. Uh, a lot of poverty was in that place. Uh, I, I know this sounds like a script that people use that I grew up in poverty, but me, I grew up with a lot of uh, challenges when we were growing up. My dad was a government uh, officer, and uh, you know government officers don't earn a lot of money. So we happened to grow there until the time I was around seven, eight years, and then we moved to a place called Tena Estate. Now it happened that uh, when we moved there, my dad took a, a loan to buy a house, otherwise called a mortgage, and that now made even the little income that he had to be even more or less than it was. And so I went into a school there called Tumaini Primary School. And in that school, my father was having so many financial problems that we used to wear, if you remember, some plastic shoes that were called sandak. So those sandak shoes were made of plastic, and when the sun would be hot, my friend, you are like being roasted inside those shoes. And the opposite was true, that when uh, it rained, now, you know, the way shoes soak in the water, those shoes could not soak in the water. They would, uh, water would enter there, and then when you're walking, people are hearing, pocho, pocho, because of the water inside the shoes. And so that was my, my growing up, uh, a lot of challenges uh, in government schools. Then I grew up uh, within that Tumaini primary school space, when I was in around class seven, I gave my mother a lot of problems. She was teaching in the next school that was next to Tumaini Primary School. It was called Kifaru Primary School. So she decided, uh, because I, I, don't, I don't want to risk losing my son, I'm going to transfer my son to be where I am. So I was transferred to the school where my mom was teaching, which was called Kifaru Primary School. That's where I did my class seven and eight. And then, uh, of course, I didn't pass very well because I was a very problematic teenager, for lack of a better word. Uh, uh, had been influenced by a lot of wrong people. In fact, I look back in my life and I realize actually a lot of the guys we were with in primary schools are now history. Some of them were dead, killed in crime. Others went and they drank themselves silly and got into fights and they were killed. So just that is the kind of uh, growing up that I grew up in. And then after that, now when I was going to high school, I went to, uh, I was invited to a school or uh, I was called to a school called Parklands. Uh, secondary school my mom didn't like that school my elder brother who was uh, three years older than me happened to have gone to a school in uh, south b called uh, highway secondary school it's it actually happened to be like the best public day school at that time that was a boys school so she hustled uh, talked to people and uh, got me an opportunity to go there and I think that's where, and I know we'll talk this a little bit later in this conversation, but that's where now my life began to be transformed into, into entering like a good trajectory of what I would call a good life. Because there, when I got into that school, I got into an, a space that had a lot of very positive influence. First and foremost, we had a, a head teacher that was called Mr. Njeru who was a very tough disciplinarian. I mean, you wouldn't uh, misbehave in that school. And then we had a discipline master that, that was called Mr. Wambugu. We used to call him Bugus. And uh, he used to walk with a very big stick. And uh, I mean, we were being caned. It's not like now when uh, people just do all sorts of things. The discipline in schools in those days was, was a lot. And I just grew up in that space. Then uh, again, now finished uh, high school and went to college then now got into the working space. It's interesting that I mentioned to you that uh, my teenage in primary school especially was, was, uh, was a messed up teenage because I got into a lot of problems. And then now when I went to high school, the highway secondary school, Form 1 was also a very difficult year, actually Form 1 and Form 2, because I also got into some, uh, some, some groups that were not very good uh, for my moral formation. But uh, now when I got to Form 2, is where we got one of the guys that uh, I was in the same class with. He was called Peter Kibe. So this guy, 
you know the way schools close and you go on holiday so this guy came back and he told us about this faith experience that he had of encountering Christ and coming to know God and so he started preaching to every one of us can you believe that that young man actually got a whole class of 40 boys almost all of them converted and that's where my journey with Christ began this guy really influenced us in a huge way and uh he literally made the school to become like a church. I remember there's a time we were all uh, taken for disciplinary action because a lot of our times, instead of being spent on studies, it was being spent on reading the Bible and going for missions. That was like what now began to take our focus. And so that's how I came to know Christ under the preaching of this guy that was called Peter Kibe. And I began to really grow under him because for him, it was not like, you know, today's Christianity where people get saved and then they are just kawaida people. This guy got saved and you know he was living in Pumwani, uko karibu nagikomba. And this guy, when he got saved, he like went to the extreme. You know, like reading the Bible all the time, praying all the time, uh, evangelizing to people all the time. I remember that that guy was so radical. We literally now started influencing the school and we started prayers in every class from one to form four there were prayers that were happening in the morning before the study started and so that's how i began to really get to know god and i i also began to be really passionate about the things of god because when this guy introduced us to christ we were in that place where we were looking for an identity we didn't know who we are and you know when you're in high school there are a lot of things that try to define who you are as a man so you know there are people who get into drugs to find an identity there are people who get into girls premarital sex and all those things so for us, when we found this spiritual experience, it gave us such an understanding of who we are. We discovered we are sons of God. And so that like became a very defining moment for me, especially where my identity is concerned. In fact, that thing shaped my life so much that I never doubted who I am. I never got defined by my performance in school and I didn't perform very well in school. I didn't get defined by the fact that I had a girlfriend or I didn't have one. My identity now became I'm a child of God, I'm a son of the kingdom and now reading the Bible began to really influence my worldview and my way of thinking. And so that was like the, the birthplace of my formation as a man and it has influenced me until today. I usually tell even my wife and my children that wherever my story is talked about, my encounter with Christ uh, in high school under the influence of this guy that was called Peter Kibe will always go down as one of the things that really shaped my life. And I think one of the biggest problems we have in Africa is a problem of broken masculinity. If you listen to the story, in fact, the other day I was looking at a story that was carried out by the BBC and how so many men are committing suicide, so many men are in drugs, so many men are jobless, so many men don't know what a man is. So one of the biggest problems that we have in Africa, which I actually think every other problem we see is a spillover of that problem, is the problem of broken masculinity. Men not knowing what a man is and men not knowing how a man is supposed to function. That's why most men are caught up looking for money. They cannot lead their families well. Most men don't know how to have self-control. So we have issues of rape. We have issues of drug abuse and a lot of things that are happening in society are actually an outflow of broken masculinity. And one of the things that, just going back to my story, one of the things Christianity helped me to do is to have a masculinity that is whole. Because I, I, I usually believe that unless a man finds a relationship with God, he will always live out a masculinity that is broken. And so that's the first thing that I'll point out that I think is a huge menace in society. Number two is what I call dysfunctional leadership. People who are in leadership that don't know what leadership means and they don't know how leadership is supposed to function. You look at any company that is going down, any company that used to be a big company and is going down, or any country that used to be a good country and it's going down, at the heart of it, you will find the issue of dysfunctional leadership. And by dysfunctional leadership, I, I don't mean that the leader hasn't been to school or the leader does not know what is supposed to be done. I mean a leader that is so drunk with power that they don't know that leadership is not about getting more for yourself, it's about doing more to serve others. Actually, 
the day we don't define leadership in the context of servanthood, then our leadership becomes about greed and power and self-accumulation. So that's, that's the second thing that I, that I think is a huge challenge in Africa. The third thing and the last thing that I think I'm going to mention that I think is a big issue in Africa is the issue of broken family. And you realize those three things are connected. When men are broken, when leadership is dysfunctional, then family is going to be broken. Now, when family is broken, it actually means the man and the woman are not getting together and then they are trying to raise their children in that setup where they themselves are not getting along. So you can imagine the children grow up in a toxic environment and guess what? Children that grow up in broken families become broken men and broken women and then they grow up, they become broken leaders and then they grow up and they grow broken families and then the brokenness inside in society continues. So I think if we can fix those three things, broken men, dysfunctional family, and dysfunctional families, then we will be able to begin to get our Africa back to where it's supposed to be.